25 voting boots, 14 ballot boxes, 13 aspirants, and 767 accredited delegates. The People's Democratic Party, PDP, is about to make a major decision concerning the 2023 presidential election. However, shortly before the commencement of voting, there's a twist of event as Governor Aminu Tambual of Sokoto State announces his withdrawal from the race. Those who are delegates here should vote for Alhaji Atiku Abubakar. PDP. That leaves the field for 12 aspirants as the voting process commences. The delegates file out according to their states, called out in alphabetical order. They are checked one after the other before proceeding to cast their votes. After about two hours, voting ends and the sorting of votes commences. Then the votes are counted. Udom Emmanuel Gabriel. One, two. A total of 764 votes are cast, 12 votes are void, as the former Vice President al Haji Atiku Abubakar polls 371 votes, Governor Yesim Wiki of River State polls 237 votes, former Senate President Bukola Saraki polls 70 votes, Governor Udom Emmanuel of Akwaibum State polls 38 votes. Governor Bala Mohamed of Bauchi State polls 20 votes. Former Senate President Pius Ayim polls 14 votes. Mazi Sam Uwabua and the only female in the race, Diana Tari Oliver, polls one vote each. I, Senator David Alecheno, Bonaventure Mark, GCON, Hereby return Atiku Abubakar as the winner of the election. He is hereby return elected. Congratulations. In his acceptance speech, Mr. Atiku Abubakar calls for the unity of the party. I will work to ensure I restore unity and I give a sense of belonging to all Nigerians irrespective of their places of origin and irrespective of the faith they practice. I also committed that I was going to deal decisively with our security challenges in this country. This is the second time the PDP will be giving its presidential ticket to Mr. Tiku Abubakar. The first being in 2019 when he lost to the incumbent President Muhammad Buhari. Emperor Simon, Channels, Television News. Well, that's precisely what we're talking about yeah. this morning. Um, the, uh, should, should we say two mornings after? <laughs> because normally when you wake up, uh, there's always the morning after. But Sunday was that morning. Uh, today is Monday. And we have with us this morning uh, one of the participants in the PDP presidential primary. Mazi Samo Habuwa joins us. He's the PDP presidential aspirant. Uh, welcome to the program this morning. Thank you. We Thank also you. have with us Senator Shehu Sani, who's, a who's also a member of the People's Democratic Party and had also contested to be um, a governor on the, under the platform of the PDP in Kaduna State. Senator, you're welcome to Sunrise Today this morning. Thank you. Well, finally, um, the primaries are done. This is what we saw, that the PDP decided to go for open secret ballot. For a number of people, they say that that is certainly something worth celebrating. Uh, do you agree with them? Uh, let me come to you, Mazi. <clears throat> well, well I, I think that, 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 that was a good development because I think it was in the part of the decision of the, uh, the leadership of the party to make the um, primaries as transparent uh, and as, as open as possible. And I think this was a good attempt to ensure that that happened. 
So do you think that that reflects uh, the number of people that you were able, able to appeal to um, through the, going by the votes that you scored? Well, uh, most uh, voters were influenced by different factors. I had always thought there were three things that could make somebody vote for you. One would be um, the profoundity of your thoughts, your ideas, what you want to achieve by coming to the office, uh, what I call your vision. Uh, the other would be how you're able to convince him either directly or through third parties, what we call influencers. And of course, in Nigerian politics, the other is the effect of money. Uh, so by the time you see the votes, imagine you see that there's a skewed, um, um, the, the voters came up to that decision facing different influences. So it did not reflect what I was hoping, but that was the reality of what we confronted. Well, of the three factors, what were your strongest points? This three My factors vision. Mentioned. My vision, I had vision, I had ideology. Everybody told me, look, this is what Nigeria needs. They need a new Nigeria. They need people like you with competence, experience, and character. But you know, this is Nigeria. This is Nigeria. They kept telling me this is Nigeria. I said, we think this country should change, you know, in terms of how it decides to select its leadership. Because if we keep doing the same thing, we are likely going to be getting the same answers. That was our preaching. Now, each time we spoke, they say you preached very well. Uh, but we knew that uh, they, 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 that wasn't all that was needed to be done uh, in the context. Do you feel betrayed that, I mean, for your, from your state, you didn't even get the 17 votes, which, I mean, we'll expect that it's a given at least. That's yeah. where you're from. Yeah. 17 delegates should yeah. naturally be behind you. Yeah. Do you feel betrayed by the delegates from your state first? Well, I feel disappointed. I feel disappointed um, that uh, it happened that way, but then... Uh, it's the nature of politics and uh, the nature of the level of uh, um, <clears throat> the structures of delivering uh, political thoughts and opinions uh, in what we have in this country. There's a lot of capture, a lot of uh, uh, influence that sometimes al doesn't allow the individual voter to exercise much discretion. If, if somebody who has a lot of influence, political, financial, puts you and uh, says, this is where you should go. Very many people have the lever to uh, follow their conscience. And many also have the uh, difficulty in seeing money and ignoring it, especially when it's substantial. So it's human behavior. Are you looking at today, the benefits of today? Are you looking at tomorrow or the day after? So there are all kinds of considerations in coming to a conclusion in deciding who to vote. And it happened here. And let's, let's, let's be true, this is not the first time. <laughs> During the last PDP election in uh, Port the same way, the same pattern. And so it's nothing new. So if those were, were only hoping that it was going to get better with the entrance of people like us who represented different view, different worldview, different perspectives, that it could moderate things, you know, that mm -hmm. who are, were more willing to listen to what you're saying and uh, the kind of change or difference you make, but that didn't seem to cut the eyes. Well, distinguished, let me ask you, I mean, you have been a very keen observer of the process and you've also been an active participant in your state. Um, I'd like to know whether the results uh, proved any surprise for you. Um, thank you for having me in your program once again. Well, our democracy is 22 years old, and it is expected that each time you have an election, there should be some form of improvement in the way the quality and the transparency of the election, electoral process uh, unfolds. But it is clear that um, despite attempts to reform our elections for the better, there are gray areas and dark areas that remains unchanged for years. Uh, to me, I believe that if this democracy is to survive and if democracy is to really live up to its name as a democracy, uh, those ingredients that made it possible for people to participate either as electorate or as aspirants or as candidates, 
must be seriously taken care of to ensure that the game is played according to the rules. I participated in the election and I have seen that there is no better time for us as a people and as a nation to focus on the way aspirants emerge as candidates than now. And I believe whatever government that is going to take over power, and whoever is going to take over power, and hopefully it will be the People's Democratic Party, this issue needs to be squarely addressed. I particularly has shown concern in the way aspirants uh, converse for votes, because we are not conversing for votes, votes based on policies and programs and agenda candidates have. We are simply in a bidding process. The primaries was more of a bidding process, more like an auction you have in eBay and other Sutabi, where you go meet the delegates and then they tell you what your opponents have offered them and you are to top it off for them to vote for you. So, despite the fact that that was what has happened, but I believe that for the fact that the opposition, the main opposition in the country, has been able to conduct its primaries peacefully and winners emerged, I think this is the time for us to do the needful. Because if you don't address money politics, the idea of delegates turning the whole primaries into a market, we will not have candidates. We simply have businessmen, people who bought positions of power. And um, in a country like ours, where everyone or majority of people agree that the problems of Nigeria is leadership. Mm. So how can credible leaders emerge when you have to pay to be voted? And I believe that one of the things which I did clearly as an aspirant was to set the face by saying, I am not going to give you money. You vote for me based on my policies and agenda or else you do what you vote for other persons. And somebody needs to say no. And that person who needs to say no has to be a person who is a participant in that. Once candidates or aspirants begin to say that they are not going to give money, Nigeria's politics would eventually change. Yes. So, so clearly, pardon me, those that emerged uh, from what you have said are those who spent the highest. And there is no doubt about it. Um, in most cases, people who emerge, but it's, it's in two ways also. At the state level, when they say delegates, you ask yourself, and they say elected delegates, you need to ask them, when were these people elected? Many were not simply not elected. They were names submitted by party chieftains in the state and then appointed as delegates. And they make sure that before you become a delegate, you are prepared to do what they want you to do, and you can see the quality of people that are always uh, are appointed as delegate and so-called elected delegates, you will see that um, they are there for somebody and for something. And until that area is seriously challenged, we will continue to have problems with our electoral system. Take, for example, when the issue of electoral reform came and there was this uh, prescription that uh, candidates should only be elected through direct primaries. You can see the uproar among the political elites, the godfathers, the governors, because they knew that that was the narrow gate. The delegate system is the narrow gate where only those they want to be in power will be in power. No matter your programs, your policies, your agenda for people of your state, as long as you are in a major political party, that is likely to take over power. If you don't have money to share to delegates, you will never uh, have the opportunity. And unfortunately, we seem to have accepted or embraced or surrendered to the fact that this is 
the way the Romans do. So when you're in Rome, you should do as they do. But how can a country that is opposed to ransom payment, that is opposed to match fixing, now has itself unconscionably accepted bribery through a political process for leaders to emerge. It was done in the APC and it is in the PDP and this has been going on and nobody is saying anything. Delegates are there for money. Money was shared to delegates at all levels. And if people will not discuss this issue, then we should forget about corruption, forget about talking about anti-corruption and whatever. Because the very foundation where our leaders emerge is so decadent and rotten. Because people were not emerging as leaders because they have programs on education, on health, on whatever. They emerge as leaders because there was a bidding process. And then a governor of a state knew very well that if you have a direct primaries where card carry members are going to vote, then it is very unlikely that he will have his way. And godfathers know that that will be the, uh, what will bring the camels back. Because most candidates who are either anointed by anybody or who are favored by anybody will not like a system where they have to provide themselves for public scrutiny. In a typical ward of a political party, major political party, you have nothing less than, like in the northern part of Nigeria, you have nothing less than 20 to 30,000 members. But you only have three delegates. So if these 20,000 members are going to vote, and you can't share $10,000 to each one of them, money is not there. I thought $35,000 sure. was the highest paid. Well, I, I don't know because I don't have uh, proof of that, but I knew that that was the system. Uh, when I contested this governorship in, in Kaduna State, uh, before the elections on two days, I have to make it clear on my social media handle that I am not going to give one cobo to anybody. And not that. A few minutes before the primaries uh, started, the voting started, all the delegates were in the hall, and um, other candidates have made their offer. And then when it comes to me, I say, well, you look at my face, I look at yours. I am here and for a state that has been besieged by banditry. Uh, people have been killed every day. And for a state that needs serious leadership and intervention that will rescue us, if you think the best way for us, for you people and for the people of the state, is to elect leaders who give them money, then we have not suffered enough. Let's continue to live where we are, <laughs> under bandits and terrorists, and continue to collect money and elect people who will give you money. And, and because of that, many uh, did it. I was, in fact, in, fa in fact, expecting nobody to vote for me. So before the counting started, I, was, I just went back home. So I, was, I came, I then was called to have that. Two people voted for me without giving them anything. And that's something to celebrate. That's not something to cheer. <laughs> what, what? For the fact that I, I go to vote without giving anybody anything, I think it's a sign for Nigeria mm. that if we who can have the courage to defy the corruption system and the delegate system, we will reach where we need to. Mazi. Yeah. So we've seen, I mean, from what both of you have said, it looks like there are a lot of flaws in this whole build-up. And, I mean, the PDP is who wants to get power. That's the goal. Do yeah. you think it's moral, then, to want to achieve, to, to want to clean the nation, as it were, economically, security-wise, when the build-up in itself okay. is flawed? Well, you see, there's a culture, there's a political culture, and everywhere culture takes time to change. We came into the game to try and change that culture. And you know, culture cannot be changed by one day, such a day, a revolution, a violent revolution. So I think the culture change may, we are planting the seed. When you say it is called two voters, it's called one, violence called one, um, you, you now know that at least there's one man, or there are two men with conscience, maybe to build up uh, as we move on. Uh, it's a cultural thing. It's, uh, 
when I came into into the game, of course, I, I even said I wasn't going to uh, buy drinks. I wasn't going to give uh, logistics. Uh, you come to a meeting and everybody walk out on you. I say, this man is this. They actually walked out on you. Yeah, they they say, are you serious? You know, they, they, it is it is a cultural thing. There is like if you greet a politician, good morning. He expects you to leave some money. If he greets you, good morning, you also, it's just a culture. That's what I found out. So we began to fight that culture. And at some point, it, it was a tough job. But uh, people left us and came back. You know, just like he said, if we insist enough, if we persist enough, change cannot happen when everybody's compliant and take it as granted. Becoming president or becoming governor shouldn't be by all means. It's a sacrifice you want to make of your comfort, of your person, and even of your life. Why would you therefore spend so much money to serve people? It, it, it doesn't fit into my understanding. Uh, but that is the culture. Now, it is a national issue. It is symptomatic of the corruption that we have. So it, it, we can't take it away from one point. It's how do you holistically deal with corruption from the taxi driver, the carpenter, the motor mechanic, down to the political official political corruption. The, the federal government executive corrupts the legislature. They, they, they scrub the uh, 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 judiciary. You know, corruption is endemic and visible in the nation. And we're doing it. I hear EFCC was around, uh, ICPs was around. I said, okay, who are they coming to arrest? Is it the people who are giving or the people who are collecting? Uh, there, is, there is a major issue for our country, but as somebody told me, uh, one of the chairmen, he says, Sir Mazi, what you have said, the way you are going, is the best way. Nigeria can get it better, but you can't change it from outside. Go and look for money, wherever you can get it, come in, then you can change it. That's what is important. You must be inside to change it. You know, so uh, my hope is that someday somebody who gets in, or those who have gotten in now, will, will then decide, I've come this way. This is not the way this country can. We can become globally competitive. To can't change much. If you invest 16 billion naira, or 6 billion naira, or 10 billion naira in one activity, I, I don't know how, what is the intent, man? how would that money be recouped? Because for me, it's not a, it's not a, a business, it's a sacrifice. We're making a sacrifice. So there is problem. I know that my colleagues in Lagos can't wait to get their questions in. Uh, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, let me start with Senator Sani. Uh, when you speak about us trying to address this question of money politics, it's an important conversation to have. So could you shed some light on this for us, if you will? So how did you then emerge as senator while you were in the APC? Do we take it for granted that you equally shared money at that time? Well, I think uh, as I'm conducting this interview, the people of Kaduna State are also listening and watching. And the people of the party that I was part of were also watching. Uh, in 2014, I told them in clear terms, unambiguously, that I'm not going to pay delegates or ex -cos. And I was supported. That was a fact. So I did the same thing this time around. The last time I succeeded, but this time I, I didn't. But I believe that if we are going to change the system, somebody has to say no to it. And by saying no, it comes with consequences of losing the seat. But by saying no also, it opens a platform for a national conversation on the corruption in the delegate system. And it also opens a platform where the future generations of Nigerians can ask for for public office. I have a, a little daughter, her name was Iman. She was contesting for uh, a school prefect in primary school. And then she came back a day after the election and told me she lost. And I asked her what happened. She said her opponent, who was uh, my, my daughter is 10 years, and her opponent was also 10 years. She told me that her opponent offered to share phones 
to to the uh, to the teachers and also to the electorate, and then they they voted for her. And I said, okay, you shouldn't grieve that you lost. And let us see whether she's going to give them. Then after a week, she came back to tell me that everybody was attacking uh, and criticizing and insulting her opponent. After making false promises, she was not able to share phones to everyone. So it has gone to that level. Uh, people, when you are going into politics as, uh, as, as a fresher, what people will tell you is get money. So it means that that is the only channel for which you get into power. In my own state, a single delegate for a federal um, um, constituency was given, were given three million naira each. Three, and that is for a whole ward, you spend nine million. You, ha you have that on good authority, and Senator. The second person, was trying Senator? to offer five thousand dollars, but they say we have three million naira here. Can you we hear can me, Senator? You five thousand. So and you must stop it all uh, before. I hope you can. Is Senator, can you hear me? The the funds that you made reference to that was given to delegates. Do you have that on good authority that that actually happened? Ah, uh, it is not only good authority; it's on best authority. Uh -huh. So if you want to be very clear, I think Nigerians, we just have to tell ourselves, we shouldn't be hypocritic about these things here. People are giving delegates money. And somebody said, if we can pay for a form of 50 million naira for governorship or 21 million naira for governorship under the uh, uh, People's Democratic Party, why can't we pay delegates? Okay, what so I told them that, that, was that I was mean... a receipt for what I paid. So, Senator... But no delegate would give you any receipt. That will mean that the AFCC or the ICPC will have no excuse whatsoever not to ask questions of certain people because they can't afford to say, well, we didn't see anything. So now that this is out there, they should be able to act. But while you were in APC, I mean, you were a senator, you should have more information than those who were outside. At the time that President Buhari contested and emerged, what transpired? Did, did he, was money shared? How did he emerge? Because the impression is, he didn't share money, but he emerged as president. So is that something that we can latch on to if that was what happened? There, there are two ways to which money can be shared. But I think that question can best be answered by uh, Jagaban because he was the leader of those who worked for Buhari's emergence in the primaries in Lagos. So he, was, he is the best try and invite him to this program to ask whether money was shared. But what I know very well is that it's a situation where the candidate either pays or somebody pays for him. And many people who emerged uh, who don't have money certainly have a godfather. So if you can't get uh, money from the candidate, certainly there is a godfather who has done the job for him behind the scene. And what we should not fail to address is the very fact that as long as a system exists, where leaders can only emerge if they give bribe, because we don't just call it money, it's bribe. You pay bribe in cash to delegates to vote for you. If we cannot address that issue, we should, whoever wins doesn't win because he doesn't have programs or policies. Whoever loses is not losing or has not lost because he doesn't have good policies or programs. It's simply about what you give or what you refuse to give. So, Senator, the EFCC were on ground during the PDP uh, presidential primary. What difference did their presence make? What, what, and what's the implication of their presence at the primary? I think their presence is just symbolic and, and comical as in that very sense. Because if we are going to get down to the issue of this... Um, a delegate system, there has to be a separate commission that should be established to monitor political spending. And one of the things that need to be done is that whoever is going to be a delegate or a party executive must go to declare his asset and provide his bank details to such authority and then 
what does he have before he become an ex of the party and what has he gotten after he has become the ex Just the way public servants and elected officials do. There must be a system that you monitor uh, funds and the way uh, uh, party executives and but, but you see, delegates as they are now just come in to be delegates just some few weeks before elections. Sometimes you'll be invited by the person who wants to use you and said, I will appoint you a delegate. And then the party in the state will come, at least and, uh, will come with a list and say, these are the elected delegates. And if they are not sure of those delegates, they can change them 24 hours before the election. And then you will have paid the wrong delegate, and then some set of delegates will be brought in to the venue to vote for you. And um, before you can know it, an announcement is made that a winner has emerged. And then you go to court or wait for an appeal. And the appeal is not different from what has actually happened on the ground. All right, we've got a few more grounds to cover. But we'll go to break. And when we return, we'll take on some of those other questions. Don't go away. Welcome back to Sunrise City. We're trying to just uh, have another look at what transpired that the just concluded PDP primaries, both at the national and then state level. We've got two gentlemen in our studios in Abuja who are trying to shed light on some of what transpired that needs to be corrected if we need to have a lot more integrity in the electoral process. Mazio Hamboa, good to see you. Uh, let me ask you, well, before you got into the fray, you must have studied the system, trying to gauge what's happening before you decided to say, you know what, I will take this plunge. So uh, there's so many professionals like yourself who are there just watching and listening to you. Some of them will be discouraged seeing what's going on, saying, look, what's the point of us getting in? Because we have no intention or that kind of deep pocket, as both of you gentlemen have alluded to. What would you say now to such persons who at the moment think, should I? Is there hope or not? Thank you, Chamberlain. Good to see you. I was wondering where you've been. Um, uh, for me, uh, this is not new. Uh, and the reason some of us are coming in at this time was that we're afraid of this. We are trying to circulate and circumvent this by going into advocacy you know, chairman of MAN, chairman of Nigeria Economic Summit Group, this, that, Vision 2010. It was a way of trying to avoid confronting the monster. Uh, but, you know, you get to a point in your life, you just can't continue to run away from something that you think you have a strong motivation for, and you have to confront it. Um, I, I, I do, I, I'm not completely disappointed. The only, the only area I feel that I thought we have dented this a little bit with some of the few guys that came ahead of us. Uh, we thought that maybe we have begun to shift uh, towards uh, policy. I mean, I was the only guy who presented a policy document at our, at our primary, you know, which I eventually handed over to the, uh, and I hope they will use it, they will, the party will use it. Uh, the, the thing is that I would encourage everybody not to run away. Maybe the earlier you started, the better. Uh, so that, you know, over a couple of cycles, uh, we can hope that. But you see, the truth is that there won't be a change until the leadership decides there will be a change. The whole pro pro problem we have in our country is because of the adept leadership on a continuous, sustainable basis. The men have a leadership that is angry enough against this wholesome endemic corruption in our system, whether it is political, whether it is non-political, change will come. But if we have leaders who are compliant, who are just willing to go on with it, yeah. and it just left to those of us the stage, get bashed, and then move on, um, I don't think it's going to change. Well, you I'm began the other that, time. Example, My apologies, uh, Mazi. You, you, one of the things that you said earlier that, you know, called me, uh, my interest was, you talked about the culture in the political parties. And I'm wondering if that 
culture is something that is legislated, well, I would assume it is unwritten. So is there a way, a role for the political parties to play in ensuring that we decimate as much as possible the role of money in politics. I'm saying this because if, for instance, the uh, parties can f orchestrate a way in which the delegates come into the system and ensure a strict monitoring of the process, maybe it could help. So are you in any way saying or rather if this is what we have on our hands, are the parties, the establishment themselves, complicit? It is, it, to be sincere to you, we can't deal with this business of dealing with corruption piecemeal. It will not work. It requires leadership at the top most level. It doesn't matter how you emerge. The current people who are going to emerge or who have emerged can take a decision and say, yes, we have come, just like what President Yaradu has said. He said the election that brought us to power was the most, um, you know, uh, corrupt we are going to do something to make sure it doesn't happen again. That is what. That is where this kind of change can but start. That's, that's for first government. Of all, the party leaders you are talking about. Mazi, just just one second. That's for the government. Yes, we're talking. We're going to, going to talk about the political parties themselves because it is. We don't know which party is going to come to the top at the federal level, and we don't know which party is going to emerge at the state levels where there will be elections. So, is there a role for the political parties? who bring up these this delegates themselves to ensure that it's principles over the pockets, over profits? The question is, how did the political leaders themselves emerge? The people are placed there by the same godfathers who are preparing for election, and they make sure that those who are in the party leadership are people who work in their favor. That's the truth. So it is endemic. It is built from the foundation up. So if you have people who are at that level, who are already beholden to certain interests, then everything else will begin to fall apart. But I just imagine, and I, I think that's the way it can be solved. It doesn't matter. It's a corrupt system. There is no way you can s minimize it. But let somebody arrive at the top, the party leaders, the presidential uh, candidates, whoever it is, say, OK, so far, we can't go beyond this place. We've come this far. Let us determine to make a change. That is when it is going to work. And it can start with the political parties in a way. But even the demand side, the demand side is from the voters. And what we are saying at delegate level, sometimes it replicated at the, common, uh, at, the, at the general elections. People are asking for money. And if you don't bring money, they go to who brings money. Mm. And the moment there's a demand, Supply will follow. So it is going to be a holistic national thing. Treating it in parts and bits will not work. We need a national revolution in terms of working against this system of a corrupt system that each person is looking to take advantage and extort, extort things from other people. I'm, I'm sure that you, I mean, you already did say that you do not expect the system to change overnight. Yeah. On a on a, how do I put it now, on a clearer basis, um, what did you really think that your chances were um, in, the, in the polls? My chances were that I have always believed that things change someday, okay? I mean, you can see a Niroko tree standing. Maybe it's been eaten up by, by termites inside. But one small breeze can get it fall. It happens. Every civilization ends. Every fight ends. The point is, what at the point is he going to end? Yeah, but I mean, so I, that was I, my I, hope. I want you to project more realistically. How many figures, how many people did you believe were going to vote for you when you looked at your projections? I thought more people have voted for me. I mean, people from my state. There were a couple of people, even mm -hmm. that morning, who assured me that, look, we're, we want a change. It's not about money. Mazi, we want a change. We'll vote for you. Some even said, if we vote for you, we're going to put a sign behind our vote so that you know that we voted for you. But when the county won't vote for me, I was wondering what happened to all those promises. And, uh, and the, only, the only way I can is poverty of mind and poverty of the pocket. Because, guys, somebody makes you promises by mouth. Mm. I'm going to make sure that when we come to power, things will be well. We're going to create a level playing ground. Everybody will prosper us. Than somebody who sees $20,000 plus 10 plus 10 plus 15, all kinds of monies that have been measured. So they just, they just succumb. That's the only way. Then two, two, two. 
is the, 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 the impact of the leadership, executive leadership at different states. The leaders of those groups give them order. One person told me when I went to campaign, he said, Mazi Sam, you're such a wonderful guy. You, you, we, we wonder where people like you have been. However, I see all this way you are talking to. Will not do anything for you. He was so plain in one of the southwest. Me, he said, Professor, all this, all of us can't do nothing for you. Go and meet the man who is our commander, who is like what they call, they say, the owners of the, of the delegates. I said, the last time I heard about owners was doing slavery in the U.S., slave owners. Do you mean that there are delegate owners? They said yes. Would you say that that also revealed just how, uh, will I say, uh, I'm looking for the right word now, how naive you were about just how your party truly well, works. Yeah, it does not, it's not my party. It's how the whole system works. No, the smaller the party, the worse. Because in the smaller party, they expect me to bring all the money to set up the system. Where are we going to get the money from? It's worse in the smaller parties. This one, you already have a system. You can't even have people to talk to. No, I'm just saying you're not a new member of the PDP, are yes. you? So what I'm saying is not being naive. It mm. is a question of being optimistic and hopeful that things do change. My sister, things do change. They say if you are not in the market, you never meet the good market day. If you are waiting at home to know the good market day, you're not. You go to the market, you meet bad market, mm. you be good market. I was hoping I was going to meet good market. And the game is not lost. Okay. Because we're not, I, It's because I'm, uh, the reason I'm asking this is because of the revelations you're making in yeah. terms of how people told you that you should go to the owners of the delegates, yes. et cetera, et cetera. And, yeah. and you said that, well, uh, the last time I heard about yeah. owners was yeah. in the time of slavery. Yes. So it, it, it does show that maybe you, you didn't quite understand just what had been in place before now. That's, that's what I'm asking. Well, it is the question of being optimistic. Okay. That things do change. When you chip at them, when you have the Shehu Shanis, when you have all those who have come, who've tried, mm -hmm. you were hoping, and, and when you come through the system you've come through, and the experience you have, you just hope that things will get we'll better. Walk out I wasn't right. expecting that so, it was going to be a dramatic change. change. Yeah. Okay, so let me also pose this, because, you know, before now there had been permutations. Your party decided to throw this open and jettison zoning. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I do know that the South East did make a pretty strong appeal yeah. towards that. There was a Greater Nigeria Conference, which, uh, the, you know, which was held across political parties, and we saw a lot of uh, South East aspirants attending that particular conference. It didn't seem to have uh, made any impact, at least not within the PDP. Um, how do you think that the results that emerged from your party, what, what, do you think, what do you think it portends for the unity? I know that the current candidate is, uh, you know, coming out and saying that he's the unifier, um, et cetera, et cetera. But what do you think it portends uh, for the unity of the party and also the country? There, there is a fragility. Uh, I, I mean, and that's speaking the truth. Uh, the, this country has been known to operate on north-south, even within the constitutions of the party, north-south uh, um, you know, zoning or rotation. Now, if we have a place where we have jettisoned side, that's a consequence. I said that from the beginning, that the party must be sure that it has considered the pros and cons of the, the party is superior to my wish or individual wish. It can take his decision, but be ready to live with it. For certain, there are going to be centrifugal forces that will unleash because of the way things are working. So it creates a great challenge for the presidential candidate uh, uh, in, in our own party, uh, uh, Atiku, and I don't know who will emerge in other parties, to make a conscious effort, because I'm, I'm saying this over and over again, mm. the only hope we have for change in Nigeria is that the leader that emerges, it doesn't matter how he emerged, just decide to say, I've emerged through this corrupt system. I'm going to bring it to an end. I've emerged through this system that's inequitable, it's full of injustice, I'm going to correct it. That's why I still refer to President yeah, uh, I do. I bless his memory. Yeah. He stated, he admitted, because the, the, the redemption starts with accepting and then confessing, and then you become able to receive. So we believe that there's going to be some issues, yeah. both as a South, South, and as a South East. Of course, as you saw, the South East, despite all that we say, didn't show unity in, in, in the election that you saw. The, most of the South East uh, uh, delegates voted for now South East people. So that created more confusion. And even before now, when this case was being formed, some of our South East leaders were already supporting other 
candidates who are not solid. So it's even confused the party people to decide should we give this to the South East. They don't seem to be united. If their leaders are already rooting for other people, what okay. should we do? So that also, I think, must have affected okay. the parties from taking a final decision. Well, Senator Sonny, so from the onlookers, as it were, they see a party, PDP, your chairman is from the North. Now your presidential candidate is also from the North. And uh, there's this fragility that Mazi has even referred to in the nation, the thinking, saying, let it go to the South, even the Southeast. And it's, it's been on and on. What do you think this does for the optics of politics in Nigeria? Well, you see, you are trying to tally morality and politics in, in two ways. Uh, the problem we have is that um, each time you try to bring the ingredients of morality into politics, you will be confronted by realities that are opposed to what you're trying to do. Ideally, this is a country that has come through storms and turbulence. And those who prescribe the idea of rotation of power is to ensure equity that all parts of the country should be able to produce a leader. And knowing the demographic disadvantages as it is, variations, there are parts of the country that if you leave it up, never it will be impossible for them to produce a leader. And if you look at the, the theory or hypothesis behind quota system, it's about that. Yeah. A section of the country is seen to be educationally advantaged, and one section is educationally disadvantaged. And quota system was introduced to protect the weak and those who were behind. But we have accepted that as part of a national policy laws and our constitution. But in politics, we refuse to accept that. So the idea of zoning or rotating power is to tackle some of these issues that have threatened our existence as unity as a, in a, as a country and that is continuously becoming a problem to us. Mazi is from the southeastern part of Nigeria. Likewise, I likewise Peter Obi and Bona uh, Onu and others. But if we are going to be realistic with ourselves, that is the only part of the country that in the last 22 years has neither produced a president or a vice president. And that part of the country is now, there are people in that part of the country that are taking advantage of the fact that if we are not wanted here, then we should leave. So if you disappoint Mazi, you are falling into the hands of separatists. So in a situation like this, we must put it in our constitution. We must include in our constitution, in our laws, how these issues can be addressed. If we throw it open, certainly there are parts of the country that will never smell or taste power for a very long time. I come from the most populous um, part um, zone, which is not western, which is not western part of Nigeria. And I believe that if every zone is to be judged based on the number of people that either registered to vote or voted, my own part of the country will continue to produce a leader for as long as possible. Which so, is why but I the problem the we have, states. the problem we have is this that of what use is it if we say this is a democracy and the one part of the country continues to dominate yeah. political leadership. Yeah. But like he has said, there is a political culture and you get through it and you reform the process. That's all. There were so many expectations when Buhari came into office that there will be reforms. Being a man who has struggled, who has fought for many years to be on the throne and he became so it was expected that he will stamp his feet and march on forces, mm. entrench forces, and even offend so many people to do what is right. But each time in this country, you bring the idea of electoral reform, whether it is through West Panel or Ken Namani or anybody, you will see a lot of resistance 
whether it's electronic voting, whether it's PVC, whether it is direct primaries, direct primary. because people see electoral reform as an attack on their own power base. Yes. There is no inch of a Nigeria, the land called Nigeria, is no inch that is not controlled by a godfather. You can see if you're moving from here to Kaduna, you see the bush where bandits are. But pardon There's me. a political godfather that controls that area. <laughs> Interesting. Yes. Particularly now, I'm, I'm talking about the fragility. Yes. Do you think it further puts it in a precarious situation if this goes north again from 2023? No. Uh, well, for now, the political leaders of the opposition party have already, uh, 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 and the party has resolved and has voted for its candidate. So the expectation now is that the new leader who will emerge as a president, and that should be uh, Atiku Abubakar, being a man who has been in the position of power for a very long time with such experience and profile, he has a historic duty to sure. do what Buhari has failed to do, mm -hmm. for equity and for justice, even at least for once. Let us have a system where all Nigerians will feel that they have a stake in, in, in the enterprise called Nigeria. In fact, let's go south now to our Lagos studio for equity and fairness. My <laughs> colleagues <laughs> would like to ask you a few questions. Back so to these guys. Guys, speaking yeah, of yeah. equity and fairness, I'd like to take you back a bit to Mark West's point and um, closely related to that is the Southern Middle Belt uh, reaction to the outcome of the primary, saying that it is an affront and that uh, the political elite does not consider the unity of the country to be important. And closely related to that, Mazi, is the Southeast agitation for a presidency of Southeastern extraction. But if we look at the outcome of the results, you got one vote, and uh, Senator Ayim Parasayim, who is also of Southeast extraction, got 14 votes. What does this say about uh, the seriousness of the clamor for a presidency of Southeast extraction? Well, for me, like I said, I was disappointed, and many Nigerians are disappointed. And if the people of the Southeast are serious uh, about it, they should have shown so by the election. But the truth is that those who elected, the few that elected, do not represent the Southeast at all. As, as uh, Comrade Sheikh Hussaini said, how did they come to be? They were just, many of them were selected, or were elected. So there's a small number. The majority opinion does not represent what we see. So we will not read this to mean that um, the Southeast is not uh, interested. They are. The, the mainstream people do, the youths want, and the rest of uh, the people of the Southeast. But it is true that the symbolism uh, exhibited by these people who voted is condemnable because I wouldn't see how I would come to. Uh, people will come and they will not vote for the Southeasterners, whatever, whatever it flights. Even if it's money, uh, there must be some considerations bigger than money. You can collect money and see vote your conscience or show that you truly want this movement. So uh, I do believe that at the end of the day, uh, rationality and like Shehu has said, let the emergent uh, presidential candidates and ultimate pres uh, 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 president of the country, again, as we all agreed, must be the PDP candidate. Let him decide. That's what he still remember him for, to reform the electoral system and give the people of just Nigeria one second. a vote. You, you said earlier, uh, Mazi, just uh, one second. Uh, I mean, the electoral... Pro just one second, Mazi. You, you said earlier that, I mean, following up on Bukola's questions just now, you said that, well, you've said that you were disappointed. But then you also spoke to the seeming disunity within the rank and file of the Southeast. So perhaps that's the question that Bukola is asking. If there is such a disunity, uh, so to speak, and that uh, you said that many people also didn't particularly agree whether or not to go in a particular tangent, should, doesn't that also suggest that it's just talk, a desire, not necessarily a will? to actually select someone of Southeast extraction. Even though it is a clamor, there seems to be no unity as to whether or not and to whom should have been put forward by the Southeast, unitedly. Well, the, 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 the thing is that is that it's symptomatic of what goes on. I'll give you an example. 
the South South people, the South, the leader Fenny Ferrari Adebayo has said the Southwest should forget about, should not contest. But are there not Southwestern people contesting? You know, um, so it, it, it's just that there is a there, 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 there is a, a kind of discordance between what the uh, political elites want or are saying and what the people are saying. That's, that dichotomy exists even in the national, what the country wants and what the political elite wants sometimes do not agree. So I agree in, in essence that it gives a sense of lack of unity, it does. Uh, 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 and those who say so cannot be blamed because the evidence seems to suggest to. But let's not worry about what these uh, 90 people or 96 people or 100 people who voted. Let's think about the majority of the people. And even not thinking about that, it, they didn't even, the, the, the call for equity, justice and fair play, just says that do the right thing for the people. It doesn't matter whether they are fighting for it or not. Let every child, let every person in the country get his due share. Let's consider the weak. Let's consider the disadvantaged. Those who cannot yell or shout, we must not deny them that opportunity because we must give them a sense of ownership so that they can bring their best. This country needs everybody pulling together to pull us out of this economic doldrum that we have and move us to uh, a prosperous nation that we deserve for all, that is safe and secure. And if you do not enthrone justice, then peace is threatened. So, uh, Mazi, just one more from here, uh, for me. You know, we've seen the statements from Hanese saying, well, they will not back the elected, the winner of the PDP primaries. They will not go too far ahead. What do you think is the implication of all that you've said about the party given a very serious consideration to uh, a candidate or an aspirant of Southeast extraction. Is this likely going to have any major impact on the chances of uh, Atiku Abubakar in the future? Well, it depends on how the party handles it. Every situation can be handled as bad as, they, as, as, bad as it could be. I, and I would like to offer uh, my suggestion to my party leadership using this platform. That yes, what has happened has happened, and the Southeast people are, are not happy, the mainstream, and other Nigerians who consider justice, equity, and fair play as an important ingredient to bring Nigeria back to where we want it to go. Uh, so it is the now left of the party leadership to take whatever preemptive action they need to take to assuage the Southeast and the South and whatever other people that feel they are being left out. It is the responsibility of, uh, of, uh, of uh, our presidential candidate, uh, Atiku, uh, and the leadership to do that. If they don't, certainly every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Right. And you can't beat a child and tell the child not to cry. Well, uh, I, some will then say that it makes sense that Mr. Peter will be left the PDP before the primaries because maybe the same fate uh, will have been his portion as well. But uh, I'm, I'm curious, would you be willing to accept maybe a vice presidential slot? Well, the issue is that, as I said in 2019, what happened today happened in 2019. There's nothing new. It's the same system. Uh, so uh, 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 we cannot pretend that it's just a different, a new development. But the issue is that I have, volunteer, I have a heart to serve Nigeria. I'm willing to make the sacrifice. And whatever opportunity presents, I will certainly consider it. It's not about me. It's about redeeming this country. It's about making, creating future for my, our children and grandchildren. It's about uniting us and making us emerge as a globally competitive nation that will be at peace with itself and respected. So whatever role that God grants me to advance that vision, mm -hmm. I will gladly uh, I will have gladly take. Interesting. We're winding down now, but Senator, I needed to land on a point you were making earlier. You were talking about forests and how these forests have even godfathers. Am, am I right? Yeah. <laughs> what, what I'm trying to say literally is that every inch of the territory called Nigeria is controlled by a certain godfather, whether it's local or statewide or regional. So in that respect, those godfathers will always see attempt to reform our elections as has been an intrusion into their own power base. But this is a historic opportunity for the opposition to get to power and do 
what is right. And what is right specifically is exercising the evil of money in politics that will make it easier, simpler, and possible for men and women of integrity to aspire for public office and be elected into office. That is the only way we can go about it. The election, the primaries has come and gone. Let us rally round the presidential candidate of the PDP, Atiku Abubakar, for him to reform Nigeria, for him to restore peace, order, and do what is right for this country. The ruling party has done what they could. For eight years, you have seen what you have seen. And I believe that it is time to have a new person in power to ensure that this country is united, secured, so that we can move ahead. But don't, don't forget that the ruling party has its own primaries next week. And um, it was just before your primary that INEC, um, you know, moved the deadline for the con 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 for conducting primaries and the submission of names. Do you think that maybe uh, gives an undue advantage or maybe puts you at a disadvantage? I wonder how you took in the whole shifting of the deadline. You see, in, in other countries, the opposition tries to wait for what the ruling party will do. But in this situation, you can see the, the APC is always waiting for what the PDP will do. They don't even know where their chairman will come from until the PDP decided they should go to North, North Central, and then they, they followed and sent to North Central. They decided before that they were going to shift power to southern part of Nigeria. Yeah. Then later, there was this that we have not decided, and it is open. And now you see them, they kept changing their timetable in order to wait to see what the opposition is going to do. And right now, they are so confused. They don't even know where, whether to zone power or to leave it open. They are so indecisive. And you can even see the extension of this INEC timetable. It's more to their own favor because they can't even screen their candidates they just don't know what to do. You need to take a decision. You are in charge of Nigeria. You are a ruling party. You should be the first setter. But it appears that this is not the case. A, a part, a, a someone from northern part of Nigeria has been the president for eight years from a, from a ruling party. So if logically you should send it to the south, the opposition party may not be obliged to do that because they want to win election. Yeah. They want to win election, and you have to have the power before you think of rotating it or not rotating it. So that is why the Atiku factor now has been able to play. But now they even don't know what to do. Well, clearly you're also watching what's going on in the uh, main part. In fact, we've seen headlines. I think Governor Omai is saying that he'll defeat your candidate before 12 noon on election day. So it looks like even the main party APC is quite sure of getting this. So uh, you're watching clearly. Do, do, you, do you think that they might also maybe uh, throw this open or just zone it to a certain region? From what we have seen, if APC is follow follow, they don't have the confidence to create initiative. They don't have initiative. They want to do, you know, and find a way to add smart PDP. Isn't that what the game is about, really? Well, well, that's what it is. But the issue is then that there is an uncertainty as to what they want to do. Maybe they will follow the example of, uh, of the, 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 the PDP did not zone to the, to the north, but they treat open. And because of uh, all the other consideration we have seen, uh, uh, Atiku Abubakar, His Excellency, has emerged. So if they throw it open <laughs> and we follow the same trajectory, maybe uh, somebody else may match who has some of those uh, factors that we spoke about. It's uncertain, but I think what Chair is saying is that there ought to be a leader. Right now, the PDP is the leader. So it's leading and APC is following. Okay. Uh, well, I expected that, clearly. It, it's politics, but I, I think we have to anchor at this point. Uh, the coming days will be quite interesting. But I'd like to thank you so much, uh, Mazi Samo Habuwa, uh, PDP presidential aspirant. and. It was good seeing you on the floor and following the whole process. I think hopefully a lot of people are, are influenced and motivated by that, as well as Senator Sheo Sunny, who's a PDP governorship aspirant as well for Kaduna State. Thank you so much for your time on the program. This thank you. Thank you for calling.
Well, let's take this quick break and we'll be back uh, taking a look at the elections. We'll be speaking with, of course, the umpire and uh, civil society, especially regarding the issues that have come up about the timetable of the election. So please stay with us. Yeah.